Before I start this opening story, I just need to tell you that my father's first name is John. When I was in Chicago, so this is over 30 years ago now, I was a young pastor in my second church, and the phone in the pastor's study rang. And I picked it up, and the voice at the other end introduced himself as a funeral director. And then he said to me, I'm wondering if you would be willing to do the funeral for John Viss. And I thought, this is some kind of sick joke. Well, it wasn't a sick joke. A man named John Viss had passed away at an advanced age, and the family remembered that he had been baptized in, quote, a Dutch Reformed church, unquote, though they had no idea which one. And so they asked that the funeral director find a preacher from a, quote, Dutch Reformed church, unquote, to conduct the funeral, and I was tapped. I will tell you that that funeral was one of the saddest events in my four decades of ministry. In addition to the piano player and the funeral director, there were six people in the room. I think they were probably children and perhaps in-laws, just six children. It was clear looking at them that they didn't really want to be there, but they were fulfilling their duty. To make matters worse, the funeral director and piano player sat next to the piano in the back of the room while I was conducting the service and talked to each other in audible tones so that I had to speak up so that I would be heard over their chatter in the back of the room. I mean, this is, this is awful. And I had given the funeral director and piano player a order of worship because the family had asked that a couple of songs be played, Amazing Grace or whatever they chose. And so at one point I said, at this time we'll just quietly listen as the piano player plays Amazing Grace. And they chattered away. True story, this is all true. And then I said, at this time, the piano player, I mean, it, it was truly an awful thing. And what was so sad about it was this was a man in his 80s who had fathered children and there was no sense in that room that anybody really cared, that anybody had in fact loved this man. He had died for all intents and purposes, utterly alone. There is no greater emptiness than that feeling that nobody really loves me. Nobody really cares. And I have talked to so many people in my years in ministry who at one level or another have expressed those thoughts. They're in marriages that feel uh, an empty husk with no real caring. They, they have children who want nothing to do with them. They have never married and they don't feel like there's really a place for them in the church because the church is so wrapped up in the nuclear family and husbands and wives and children. And if you don't fit that, they don't feel like the church really loves them. It's an awful, awful feeling. Madeline Murray O'Hare, who was uh, past many years now, but the outspoken atheist who was instrumental in getting prayer removed from the public schools in our country, when she died, her journal was found and she had written in there many times, plump somebody, please love me. And what an awful feeling. And, and, and so when people don't feel loved, they will look for love. And they will look for it so many in the wrong places. They'll say, if only I can succeed, people will, will love me. Or you know, if, I, if I sleep with this man, maybe then he will love me. Or if I can make myself pitiful enough, they'll feel sorry for me. And as a result, they will care for me. The trouble is it doesn't work. 
people who chase success end up feeling used and unappreciated. And, and the same for people who try to use sex to receive love. Yeah. People who um, uh, want to be pitiable and think that's going to bring them love end up simply treated with contempt. I want to say to you today, if you sometimes feel unloved, you're not alone. Many of us have, and some of us right now do. But I also want to tell you that I have hope to offer you today, because there is someone who loves you very, very much, and that person matters very, very much. So where do we look for love in the right place? Well, here's the answer. God loves you. And you say, okay, Bill. Yeah, okay. I mean, I've heard preachers say it all the time. I've, I've heard that God, God loves me. Well, he loves everybody. You know, so he doesn't really have a choice, does he? He's kind of stuck with me. doesn't mean that it means much. Well, I want to tell you that God's love for you isn't stuck with you, and God's love for you isn't something he has to do. God's love for you is focused, and it is individual, and it is amazing. I'm going to read for you in just a minute a story that illustrates God's love for each one of us. A story about a man named Hosea. Kind of an odd story. God comes to Hosea, and he tells Hosea he wants him to marry an adulteress named Gomer. And that really is her name, Gomer. Don't get diverted by that. I'm sure her last name wasn't Pyle. But, you know, her name was Gomer, and she was a loose woman, and God still said, you marry her. And so Hosea married her. Now, God knew that Gomer would be unfaithful, but God wanted Hosea to marry her anyway, and it's a picture of his love for us because the Bible describes our relationship to God as, as a marriage where we are his bride and he brings us into this covenant of marriage with him, this relationship of love, knowing that we will be unfaithful to him, but still he enters this relationship. After Gomer gave birth to three children, she left the marriage, she just ran out on the home, and she became a prostitute. She spent her years traveling around the world, selling her body to strangers. The years passed. Hosea went looking for her. He found her. She was on the auction block to be sold as a, um, an object. Hosea bought her back for a few pieces of silver, a few bushels of barley, and he brought her home. This wife who had deserted him, he brought her home, took her into his arms and said, come home, live with me, and I will live with you. The story of Hosea's love for his runaway bride is the story of God's love for us because whenever we feel like we are unloved for a time, the story tells us that God still loves us and God still cares for us and God still reaches out for us. And here is the story as we find it in Hosea 2, at least a piece of it. God says, Therefore I am now going to allure her. I will lead her into the wilderness and speak tenderly to her. And I will give her back her vineyards. And I will make the valley of Achor a door of hope. And then she will respond as in the days of her youth, as in the days she came up out of Egypt. And in that day, declares the Lord, you will call me my husband. You will no longer call me my master. And I will remove the name of the Baals from her lip. No longer will their names be invoked. In that day, I will make a covenant for them with the beast of the field and the birds in the sky and the creatures that move along the ground. Bow and sword and battle I will abolish from the land so that they may all lie down in safety. And I will betroth you to me forever. I will betroth you in righteousness and justice, in love and compassion. I will betroth you in faithfulness, and you will acknowledge the Lord. Three quick points. Number one, 
This passage tells us that God loves each of us personally. We are not just part of the crowd. It is not just, well, yes, God has to love everybody. No, God loves us personally. In verse 16, he says, I will bring you into a relationship with me where you will no longer call me my master. You will call me my husband. He's saying, we will enter into a deeply personal, covenanted relationship of love, one for the other. God doesn't want us to feel like we're his slaves. He wants us to feel like we're his spouse. See, God wants a relationship with us that's, that's based on love and not on law, that's based on devotion and not on duty, not of tyranny, but of tenderness. I mean, listen to how this passage I just read starts. He, he says about Gomer that I will allure her. I will lead her into the wilderness and speak tenderly to her. It's, it's, it's words of deep affection and personal love. You may feel unloved. You may even feel like it's not even possible for God to love you, but I guarantee that nothing you've ever, ever done is worse than this picture of Gomer and her unfaithfulness to Hosea. I mean, it was, it was just absolutely direct and evil and yet Hosea reaches out and says I allure you I bring you back I want you to see me as your loving husband God loves you with all his heart he directs his love to you personally as an individual his love has directed you in, in one sense as if you're the only person that matters on earth because each of us matter that much to him. God not only loves you as who you are and where you are and no matter what you've done, God's love for you is eternal. He says in verse 19, I will betroth you to me forever. Now the word betroth speaks of the closest we have in our, in our language is engagement. We got engaged. We're, we're, we're committed to each other. We're going to get married. The interesting thing I find it fascinating that in this era, which was also true in the era of you know, when Jesus walked this earth, was that it was actually easier to get a divorce after you were married than it was to break a betrothal before you were married. I mean, just a fascinating reversal. You know, we, we will say to, you know, if we have a, a child who's engaged and we really think it's not good, and we see all kinds of trouble ahead. If, if they will listen to us at all, we will, we will counsel them and say, you know, it's a whole lot easier to break this off now than it will be if you get married. And you see the same, you see, see the same patterns that we see and, and the same abuse that we see and so forth. Now is the time to get out. Back in that day, it was the exact opposite. Once you were divorced, all you had to do was say to someone, I divorce you, I divorce you, I divorce you. And it was, well, the man would say to the woman, the woman didn't get away with that. But, uh, you know, it was, it, was, it was just a kind of a strange reversal. And here, God takes that betrothal, which is already such a deep and binding commitment, and he says, and I will betroth myself to you forever. It's permanent. There is no way out. In the 1970s, there was a song, I looked it up on YouTube again last night, and I wouldn't recommend that you make the effort, but it had interesting lyrics. It was, falling in and out of love with you, falling in and out of love with you, don't know what I'm going to do, I keep falling in and out of love with you. And I think that describes sometimes our relationships, unfortunately. We cannot have the kind of commitment and faithfulness at the level that God does. But God's love for us doesn't get bigger on our good days or smaller on our bad days. His love for us is ever and always and forever. A few years ago, there was a Wendy's commercial that began with a mother saying, Kids, most days you love them, but some days, well... And I will tell you, the ad actually didn't run very long because they recognized that it really wasn't a message that resonated all that well because parents know that, you know, 
They may not always like their kids. I certainly didn't. But my love never wavered. There's a difference. And so, you know, some days you love them, other days well didn't resonate well. Well, God's love is like that. It's not that it's bigger on some days and less on others. In Jeremiah 31, God says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. I have drawn you up with loving kindness. God loves us individually, personally. He knows my name. God loves us, me, forever. And nothing I do ever decreases or increases what is already an overwhelming love. And God loves us without holding anything back. In our human relationships, it's really kind of hard to love 100%. Because what we discover is that it is the people that we are closest to who can hurt us the most. Right? I mean, if, uh, if, if you come up to me, I I'm going to be in the back. I'll shake hands if you want to shake hands. If you don't, know it's COVID season or whatever. Don't feel like you have to. But, but if on the way out you say, you know, Pastor Bill, I wish you would never come to this church again. I just don't like the way you preach. I'll chalk that up to information. If Sandy, my wife, would ever come up to me and say, Bill, you know, as a preacher, you're really pretty lousy. And you know, I'd, I'd really rather not go to a church that your pastor at. Do you mind if I go over to you know, Pleasant Street instead of Fairlawn or the other way around? Because, you know, I, I mean, that would cut to the quick, right? That's, there, there's a difference in how we respond to how people respond to us. And so it's hard to give ourselves 100% completely without any reservation and without any holding back of how we're feeling or what we're thinking or who we are. God's approach to us is completely different. From beginning to end, he already knew, he already knows that our sin is going to happen. He knows that we are going to break his heart and still he enfolds us and loves us and receives us completely. People may be capable of loving you, loving you only halfway, but God isn't. God's love for us is unconditional. People may love us for what we do. God loves us for what we are and sometimes in spite of what we are. Others may love us temporarily. God will love us for others forever. Um, people may love us for what they see on the surface. You know, they, they got a lot of money, they can buy me nice things or you know, they're, they, they make me laugh or, or whatever. God loves us even though he knows our deepest, darkest secrets. People may love us in an on and off matter, manner, you know, falling in and out of love with you. God's love with us is always on. He doesn't hold anything back. I mean, here's what he said. I will betroth you in righteousness and justice, love, compassion, I will betroth you in faithfulness. Five characteristics. Righteousness, justice, love, compassion, faithfulness. He, he promises us eternal love with all of these qualities. Not because we have those qualities, because we don't. But because those qualities are who he is and there is no other way for him to relate to us other than in complete righteousness and holiness and justice. God loves you. He holds nothing back. He's not watching you from a distance with his arms folding, waiting to see if you're going to be worthy of his love. In fact, it's the other way around. He's looking at you as the father in the story of the prodigal son. On the path, broken, having rejected, having disrespected the father. And that story of the prodigal son is absolutely amazing. I'm not going to preach it now. I'm sure most of you have heard the story. That father embarrassed himself 
You know, he girded his loins. Basically, he took his robe and he wrapped it around his waist, exposing his legs, which was just an unthinkable thing to do, and raced down the path so he could embrace this son. What God has done for us, even after we have left him and the three kids behind, even after we have lived a life that is filled with sin, and he did it for one reason, love. Arguably the most famous text in Scripture, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. When Hosea found Gomer in the town square, about to be auctioned off as a slave to do whatever her master would require, there was nothing she could do to save herself. She could simply accept the fact that Hosea cared for her enough to buy her, allure her, take her home, and say, Gomer, I still love you. God comes to you today, and he buys you with his son's blood, and he races down the path, and he reaches out his arms, and he says, yes, I do love you. Please come home. Let's pray. Lord, what an awful thing to live thinking that no one cares. And what a wonderful thing to know that you do. To know that in spite of our worst faults, our many failings, in spite of so often falling short, you still come to us. You still allure us. You still declare your faithfulness and love for us forever in all righteousness and justice and faithfulness. On this day, if any of us are feeling alone, if any of us are feeling abandoned, if any of us are feeling like there is no one who cares, may we know with a certainty that cannot be shaken that there is one whose love will always be there. And we thank you for that love in Jesus. Amen. Before we sing, You Are My King, I realized long after I had sent a note in to Joel in the office that I was going to use this passage today, that it was Mother's Day and that this was kind of an odd passage for this day. I mean, it's a story of a grossly unfaithful mother named Gomer. And yet, and, and I will tell you the reason that happened is that I'm not always the brightest bulb in the pack. And I was asked two months ago, and I just didn't realize that May 8 was Mother's Day. <laughs> so I picked the next sermon in a series that I'm working through here. But I got to thinking about it, and I thought, you know, it, it is okay. And it is appropriate, because I have read again this week as a pastor coming up to Mother's Day that there are many women who will not come to church on this day because they are so hurt for a variety of reasons. And so before we stand to sing Amazing King, I just want to read a short poem by a lady named Amy Young. Some of you may have heard this in the past. It's about six or seven years old. But it expresses, I think, my heart, and I hope the heart of this church. To those who gave birth this year to their first child, we celebrate with you. To those who lost a child this year, we mourn with you. 
To those who are in the trenches with little ones every day and wear the badge of food stains, we appreciate you. To those who have experienced loss through miscarriage, failed adoption, or running away, we mourn with you. To those who walk the hard path of infertility, fraught with pokes, prods, tears, and disappointment, we walk with you. Forgive us when we say foolish things. We don't mean to make this harder than it is. To those who are foster moms and mentor moms and spiritual moms, we need you. To those who have warm and close relationships with your children, we celebrate with you. To those who have disappointment, heartache, and distance with your children, we sit with you. To those who have lost their mothers this year, we grieve with you. To those who experienced abuse at the hands of your own mother, we acknowledge your experience. To those who lived through driving tests, medical tests, and the overall testing of motherhood, we are better for having you in our midst. To those who have aborted children, we remember them and you on this day. To those who are single and long to be married and mothering your own children, we mourn that life has not turned out the way that you long for it to be. To those who step-parent, we walk with you on those complex paths. To those who envisioned lavishing love on grandchildren, yet that dream is not to be, we grieve with you. To those who have been emptier nest, excuse me, to those who will have emptier nest in the upcoming year, we grieve and rejoice with you. To those who have placed children up for adoption, we commend you for your selflessness and remember how you hold that child in your heart. To those who are pregnant with new life, both expected and surprising, we anticipate with you. And this Mother's Day, we walk with you. Mothering is not for the faint of heart. We have real warriors in our midst and we remember you. Let's stand and sing Amazing Love. <laughs> 